All right, we want to uh, pursue this series that we're uh, discussing here about what every Adventist uh, scientist should know. And uh, here's a list of what we're going to be covering in the series. Uh, general philosophy involves these various topics, and I have time to discuss them all because we're time limitations. But uh, these deal with the question of the existence of God, which is a very basic question. But then we get to issues that are more important in terms of the Adventist viewpoint, the biblical viewpoint, uh, like how old is the earth, and so on. Uh, today we're talking about the first topic, let's say there are the layers, turbidites. <coughs> We've already talked about rates of erosion up left, paraconformities, we've covered those. Uh, Carbon-14 data has been covered and so on. Most of those except paleocurrents have been covered or will have been covered today. So we're finishing up this particular section. There's another section dealing with uh, challenges to young earth creationism, and uh, these will come later. And then one section dealing with Ellen White, uh, and especially the importance of alcohol and so on. So let's move to today's topic. And that deals with the important question of uh, what evidences do we have there, for instance, of the uh, Genesis flood? Well, we've covered quite a number of these uh, in some of the other topics, but we want to get to this question of widespread layers. And the, uh, probably the basic point that you find when you go out there and you look at those layers, is that there's something very different out there that went on in the past compared to what we have at present. And that difference is uh, very much uh, what you'd expect in terms of the Genesis flood. It's a uh, very salient uh, contrast, and it's very pertinent to the question, are you going to believe in a recent creation by God in six days, or are you going to believe in those millions of years? And the majority of uh, Christians believe in the long ages, uh, and the feeling that the first part of Genesis is an allegory. Well, uh, references are just put up here uh, so that those who Reaccess this can get at them. We're not going to take time to go through them, uh, but uh, it gives some resources to the scientific literature, especially uh, regarding some of the things we'll be talking about today. <coughs> when you go to the Grand Canyon uh, region and you come down from the dome of the Grand Canyon, you look at towards the north. And you, you see this grand staircase. This has a, become a lead geological classic. And uh, <coughs> you find quite a number of layers there. Um, they've been called Pink Great Cliffs and so on. So they're part of your geologic column. And those uh, uh, different layers all represent, if you know the geologic column, <laughs> which most of you probably don't, the Eocene on top. and uh, get clear down uh, to uh, Triassic or those chocolate cliffs, the lower ones there. But in the cliffs right in front of you, uh, light ones there, those are part of the Paleozoic. So uh, this is a significant part of the geologic column. And so and the issue is here, was this laid down during the flood, as the biblical model would suggest, or were these laid down over hundreds of millions of years? Quite a contrast. Um, it's part of a big debate that's been going on in the scientific community. Up till about the <coughs> beginning of the 19th century, most all scientists believed in catastrophes. So major catastrophes is part of the uh, belief and that these are these major catastrophes, uh, uh, or just one major catastrophe, especially the Bible. Most scientists believed in the Bible up till 
the beginning of the 19th century, uh, <coughs> was, was what was accepted. And then uh, in the early part of that century, uh, a number of geologists changed their minds. And they said, no, things had to go on very slowly. And uh, the idea that there were major catastrophes was rejected. And it was rejected very firmly. And the idea of catastrophes was not allowed. And uniformitarianism, as that uh, is the term that is used to describe, hey, uh, catastrophes can occur, but they're not important. In contrast, you have catastrophism, which fits with the Bible. Hey, most of that G like column was laid down uh, during the flood. And that uh, model was, was rejected, rejected for about 130 years. <coughs> In the middle of the last century, things began to change. The data from the rocks was not fitting with this strict uniformitarianism. And the scientific community changed its views. Much that we have to talk about today is associated with some of that uh, change in view. Well, uh, getting to these layers out there, we have uh, the geologic column here on the left. That's your layers uh, from top to bottom. The section that we showed you in the Grand Terracase, uh, if you can follow this arrow, uh, we show you from here down to about here, a uh, couple hundred million years according to standard geological interpretation, while those who believe in the Bible would say, this happened during the flood. So the question is, uh, you know, uh, what was involved here? A lot of time or not? And the, the two models are shown here in the, these columns, evolution going on for billions of years. The times listed here are in billions of years. Times listed here are in thousands of years. And uh, you see most of the column in the flood here. And uh, not all creationists agree at all as to where you start and stop this flood. But uh, th that is the, the uh, model that gives you the contrast between these two. We're talking about very rapid deposition here on the right, talking about very slow processes over millions of years. Now, we all know that uh, you go look at the mountains up here in San Bernardino Mountains and so on. You look at certain areas, oh, they look very familiar sometimes. Go back there year after year, it's the same thing. Nothing seems to happen. This is part of the uh, picture we have that uh, things go on very slowly. And this tends to fit with uniformitarianism. Of course, when we have an earthquake, uh, we tend to change our minds about how fast things can happen. But uh, they're not common enough that we usually don't incorporate in our thinking. On the other hand, when you're talking about a major catastrophe, like the flood, depositing most of that geologic column, uh, this is an entirely different mode of thinking. Nevertheless, there's striking evidence in those layers out there that, hey, uh, this is data that is hard to explain unless I believe in that biblical model. Well, uh, let's uh, point out a little bit about a few comments, what happened. After uh, strict uniformitarianism started breaking down <coughs> in the middle and latter part of the last century, geologists started accepting catastrophes. Uh, they, they did not put a lot, put the flood into the picture, but they said, hey, no, catastrophes happen. And uh, here, here's uh, one, one uh, comment on the profound role of major storms throughout geologic history. Well, this would be the flood uh, if there ever was a series of, of uh, storms. It would be during the flood is becoming increasingly recognized. Well, 
Uh, moving a little bit into a flood model, as you make a statement like this, just one other uh, statement like this. Uh, Kaufman, <coughs> 1983, Journal of Science, uh, probably the leading science journal of the world. It is a great philosophical breakthrough for geologists to accept catastrophe as a normal part of Earth history. So uh, there's been that change in thinking, uh, and it's been based on things that they saw in the rocks. And, uh, talked about Brett's flood earlier and so on. Now that's an example of it. Uh, we have another example today, and that is turbidites. Uh, the turbidites are a type of sedimentary deposit that you find out there when you look at these layers. And uh, they can only occur under water, and they are rapid. Uh, probably the uh, easiest way I can explain these things is, is to uh, give you an example. Uh, if you take a tank of water and you put some uh, sediment source on the left side here, uh, it's like mud. It flows down a slope. It'll try and, s and settle down in the lowest part that you see at the right. <coughs> The flow is called a turbidity current. The deposit at the right is called a turbidite. This occurs under water, occurs rapidly. The mud does not mix up well with the other water because it has a higher density. The mixture of the mud, which is uh, you know higher mineral, higher density minerals with water, uh, tends to keep its integrity. So these things flow as a unit. And when they settle down, they produce some very interesting uh, types of deposits. Uh, and uh, an example that occurred in 1929 is what is called the Grand Banks turbidite. What happened is there was an earthquake. You see North America on the left, Europe on the right. There was an earthquake uh, in Nova Scotia. And that shook loose some material from the continental shelf. This all occurred under water in the ocean. And uh, the darker brown color that you see up there represents the Grand Banks turbidite. A lot of mud was shaken loose, and it flowed down into the North Atlantic. And uh, as it did this, it ran across about a dozen transatlantic cables. Now, mud flow like this is not good for the cables. It breaks them. And you can tell where the mud flow's head is when the messages quit going across from North America to England or vice versa. Cable is broken, and you know exactly where the head of that turbidite was as it flowed in the direction of the arrow that you see there. Well, it uh, took about 13 hours to break a dozen transatlantic cables there. And you could tell how fast it flowed. Its maximum speed is about 60 miles per hour. It spread a layer that was about three feet thick over 40,000 square miles in the North Atlantic. Did that in, you know, 13, 20 hours, uh, just a few hours to do this, to spread this layer. Uh, the, it was 100, 100 cubic kilometers of material that spread there. Uh, distance of travel for maximum distance travel is about 400 miles. And uh, incidentally, ran into the hulk of the Titanic. This was 1912. <coughs> See, Titanic uh, went down. Sorry, this was 1929. The turbidite Titanic went down in 1912. Uh, just, you know, just 102 years ago. Uh, so you know, and buried some of the debris from the from the Titanic uh, when that happened. But 
important thing to geology is that, hey, uh, here we've got an example of a rapid deposit that uh, explains how you can get a fairly widespread layer in just a few hours. This is, of course, moving towards the catastrophism interpretation uh, that you see. <coughs> well, uh, geologists were studying these layers here in the Ventura Basin in California, just <coughs> a little bit west of us here. <coughs> they looked at these layers and they found something very peculiar. And this is all interpretation that took place as catastrophism was becoming acceptable again in geological interpretations. When they looked at these layers, and uh, these are just a bunch of turbidites, layers laid down by these rapid flows. Interestingly, one turbidite lays down a whole number of these layers, maybe a dozen or 20 or 50 of these layers at once. But when they studied these things, they found some shallow water shells of marine organisms, and they found some deep water shells of marine organisms. And this did not fit the idea, hey, everything's laid down here very slowly over these millions of years. Because how could you have shallow water and deep water fossiliferous material in the same deposit? Well, uh, Kunin and others in Europe had been working on uh, tank experiments and uh, rapid flows and so on. And they, they put his work together of turbidites, experimental turbidites, put it together with the data and say, hey, no, these are turbidites. They were laid down catastrophically and, you know, things got all mixed in. The, the shallow water fossils flowed down and got mixed in with the deep water fossils. And that's why you have this uh, mixture of these. It's part of the data, that many things uh, introduced catastrophism, but part of the data that helped scientists change their minds from the idea everything goes on very slowly. No, you can have catastrophes. Well, uh, <coughs> here's some more turbidites. Uh, say a query in Switzerland. Uh, this is way far away from any ocean. Uh, but each one of those layers is a turbidite. Uh, this is in New Zealand. Uh, each one of those layers has a beautiful sequence. The Bauma sequence is a, a series you find in the ideal turbidite. Turbidites are very complex. Sometimes one part gets laid down the other and so on. So it's not an easy interpretation. But these had perfect Bauma sequences in them. Uh, some of the most beautiful turbidites I, I've ever seen. Comments about these? <coughs> uh, Walker, very famous entomologist. Two decades after the acceptance of the turbidite concept, it could be stated that tens of thousands of graded beds stacked on top of one another have been interpreted as turbidity currents. So uh, it got to be almost the bandwagon ID in geology, the way that sequence stratigraphy is right now. <coughs> uh, another comment here, Middleton, uh, very famous sedimentologist. Uh, turbidites are considered to be one of the commonest types of sedimentary rocks. The interpretation is difficult at times, but the ID that things can be deposited fast was being accepted in geology. Um, <coughs> just a few comments about a single turbidite can be 600 feet thick. Uh, most of them are much thinner than that. Rarely turbidites form now in lakes in our present continents. Uh, Lake Mead, for instance, rarely has turbidites going across it from the deposits brought down by the Colorado River. Uh, the abundance of turbidites in the sediments of our continents testifies to significant underwater activity as expected during the Genesis flood. This becomes interesting, you know, 
because these are underwater and they're very rapid. Now, uh, uniform just see these turbidites there and say, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, that's fine. That it, these continents were underwater at that time, you see. You have more marine limestone deposits than all other types of sediments combined on your continents. And so when they see it, they're right. Well, no, the continent sank down. And I'm perfectly uh, in agreement with that. Uh, you've moved into a flood model. That's just what you'd expect during the flood. So uh, the witness of turbidites does have some suggestions from John. Hey, the continents are sank, sank down. Uh, they would say, of course, over long periods of time and so on. Uh, time would, uh, but the rest of it, you know, pretty much fits with uh, rapid action you'd expect during the Genesis flood. Well, with that in mind, let's look at uh, some unusually widespread deposits, <coughs> formations. Uh, geologists use the term formation for certain units that you have in the geological record, and those units. Uh, tend to be different from the layers below and above, but it's a big package of, of unique layers of formation. Here's a picture of five different formations. This is Steinecker Lake <coughs> near Vernal, Utah. Uh, the frontier formation is the one on top there. It's that brownish, tannish layer uh, that you see near the top there. Uh, that is spread over 100,000 square miles. I mean, this is, when, when you go out there and you see these layers, you don't realize how widespread some of these things are, 100,000 square miles. Uh, below it, you have this frontier formation. It's, it's a marginal marine uh, type. The frontier is considered to be a marine. It has a lot of fish scales in the marine. The frontier is that gray layer you see across there. Very interesting is the Dakota. Dakota is that light colored layer that you see there. It's very thin. I might mention the, the Maori, 90,000 square miles. Uh, Dakota, 310,000 square miles. Uh, you know, that's equivalent to about three states, three of our western states. Uh, that little thin layer. Uh, Cedar Mountain, more local deposit, only 50,000 square miles. It, it's tied with the Burrow Canyon uh, in, that, in that figure. And then below you have the Morrison. Morrison runs clear from Texas to Canada, uh, 400,000 square miles. Here's a map of the Morrison distribution. You see from New Mexico uh, down there clearing up to, uh, into, into Canada. Uh, here's a map of the uh, Dakota Formation. That little thin layer usually runs by, you know, averages about 100 feet thick. 100 feet thick layer spread over that area. You're going to have to have tremendous forces to spread a layer, a unique layer like that. Now, keep in mind, these formations have several layers, several units, and uh, they change from one region to the other. They also change vertically, uh, and some of the parts are very thin. Again, raising the problem, how do you spread such tremendous volumes of material over such wide areas under present conditions? Furthermore, how do you spread such flat layers, one on top of another, on our present topography. There's no way that you could do that. You have to have, you know, 100,000, 200,000 square miles of a very flat surface to lay another very thin layer on top of it. This is just the kind of thing you'd expect during a catastrophic major flood. As, as described in the Bible. Uh, just to give you some pictures of the Dakota, 
Here, here is uh, the Dakota. It's that little whitish layer or tan layer you see there at the end of the arrow. Uh, this is in northern Utah. Uh, here's the Dakota in Arizona near the town of Cayenta. Right at the end of that green arrow, you can see it across the picture there. Uh, here is the Dakota in Colorado. It's that cap rock you see at the top of those hills there, at the end of the green arrow. Uh, here is the Dakota and, uh, at uh, Continental Divide, New Mexico. Uh, and you see it across, form that light layer you see all the way across the picture. Very thin layer. Find it over. And, you know, it's in five other states. Uh, this is so different from what's going on at now where rivers, you know, settle, produce a few sediments here and there, or a small lake and so on. We're talking about semi-continent wide distribution as you'd expect from a, a major flood. And <laughs> incidentally, I might point out, as I did much earlier regarding the question of paraconformities, there's a 40 million year gap between that Dakota and the Morrison formation that's below. Remember the Morrison, we point out to you, it spread over 400,000 square miles. <laughs> Very flat, 40 million years, no erosion to speak of. Uh, looks like it was laid down very rapidly, and not over those millions of years that are proposed. Well, uh, just to, to, it's hard to imagine really how, how thin those layers are and how widespread they are. For instance, uh, <coughs> the Dakota. If the Dakota was the size of a sheet of paper, just take an ordinary sheet of paper, 20 pound weight sheet of paper. The, the average thickness of the Dakota is only 1 15th the thickness of a sheet of paper in, in proportion. I mean, these are extremely thin, widespread layers and extremely uh, different from what you expect from normally from, from the deposit. For the Morrison Formation, which is, you know, average is about 300 feet in thickness. Uh, make a sheet of paper, make it about the size of a sheet of paper. The thickness of the Morrison formation on that scale would be about one-fifth that of the sheet of paper itself, a 20-pound weight paper, sheet of paper. So almost hard to imagine forces that would you know, spread something so widespread. And of course, you have to have flat layers on which to lay this down. This is so different from what we see on the surface of the Earth at present. Well, uh, my th furthermore, these formations that are proportionally not all that thick would have to have extremely flat areas in which to have been uh, deposited. We've, we've commented on that, I'm not sure, but that our present continents that usually have significant relief are not that flat. There are some areas where you can occasionally find flatness on the continent, not on the scale that we see here at all uh, as we look at these widespread deposits. Well, uh, Norman Newell has commented on some of this in one of his papers, and uh, he makes an interesting comment here. He says, for present, search for present-day analogs for paraconformities. That, that's those gaps that we've talked about. So search for that. <coughs> Uh, in limestone sequences is complicated by the fact that most present configurations, speaking of the topography, chemistry, circulation, climate, and so on, notice he says are strikingly unlike those that must have prevailed when the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, that, that's the two bottom thirds of the three thirds of the uh, main part of the geologic column, spread Mesozoic its own spread over immense and incredibly fat areas of the world. Geologists admit that they, 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 this is incredibly flat. And the, the widespread distribution, this is, they're incredibly widespread. But you know, uh, 
paradigms tend to dominate, and so uh, the idea of the biblical flood does not prevail. Um, another interesting comment recently, fairly recently, uh, regarding there's another geologist coming on this. Very interesting comment here, he says. Beds may persist over areas of many hundreds to thousands of square kilometers precisely because they are the record of truly oversized events. That's what we're talking about, oversized events. <coughs> the accumulation of the permanent stratigraphic record, that's those layers out there, <coughs> in many cases involves processes that have not been or cannot be observed in modern environments. There are the extreme events with magnitudes so large and devastating that they have not and probably could not be observed scientifically. Well, that's, that's very true. I mean, when you uh, have a major catastrophe spreading layers over hundreds of thousands of square miles, it's, it's hard to, to observe it, you understand. I would also argue that many successions show far more lateral continuity and similarity at a far finer scale than would be anticipated by most uh, geologists. So. Uh, it's admitted that, hey, it's something unusual out there. <coughs> uh, Derek Ager. Paul, did you say they pronounce his name differently? I, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. Auger, Ager. I usually hear Ager. We can stick with Ager. Uh, anyway, he... He does not believe in creation, folks. <laughs> but he speaks of rocks units with a thickness of 30 meters or less in the Permian of Western Canada. So it's not just Western United States that you have this. Permian of Western Canada. That persists over areas up to 430,000 square kilometers. That's 180,000 square miles. You know, a layer just 30 meters thick. That's the same as the Dakota, of course. He also refers to a thin layer about a meter thick. That's really getting pretty thin. It can be found all around the alpine chain. So you, you go to other places, you, you find these widespread layers. In, in New Zealand, uh, we have this Amuri limestone at the end of that, it's that layer you see up there, a slanted layer at the end of that uh, green arrow to the right up there. Uh, widespread over significant part, maybe 10,000 square miles of New Zealand. In both the South Island and North Island, must have been a continuous layer between them at some time, uh, the Amuri limestone. So, uh, these widespread layers are found worldwide. Then we come to uh, the Morrison, excuse me, Chinle Formation. Chinle formation is the middle layer that you see right here. And this gets interesting. Uh, <laughs> Ager himself relates this layer, these layers, which are here in Capitol Reef, Utah, to layers in Germany and Europe. In Germany, you've got a somewhat similar sequence to this in that you have a gypsiferous layer that uh, on top and that would be the whitish layer you have here but in Germany you got a Muschelkalk layer in the middle which has marine fossils in it and then you get the red sandstone below now in England you don't have the Muschelkalk but you do have the Coupier which is the uh, gypsiferous layer on top, uh, sitting on the uh, reddish layer below. Uh, this is not quite a sandstone, but interestingly, uh, you can make some intercontinental suggestions. Now, I want you to say we need to be careful here. Uh, for one thing, Muschelkalk is not here. It's not in England, but it's in Germany. But uh, this is Triassic, exactly 
considered to be exactly in the same place in the geodetic column. And so, uh, and sometimes people correlate the abundance of marine shales and fine sediments that are you see in the upper part of the Cretaceous around the world. Uh, you can do some correlation. Be careful. Uh, there's plenty of data that you don't have to rely on on something that uh, the correlation is not always as precise as you might like, but it's interesting that you do have these major deposits around the world. Uh, your red beds tend to be Permian and uh, uh, Triassic and so on, and this is the case here, and so on. But this, uh, just looking locally here, uh, the Chin Li is this layer from here, down here in this region, clear on up here to this cliff. That's the Chinle Formation. Incidentally, uh, uh, this is the uh, basal uh, Chenarib conglomerate, we'll, uh, which is spread over, we'll talk about it in the next slide, uh, over 100,000 square miles. But uh, this Chinle spread over much more, uh, probably about 315,000 square miles. So it runs from Texas uh, clear on up to Idaho. Averages you know, 300, 400 feet uh, in thickness. Tremendously flat deposition, folks, over tremendously wide areas. Totally out of character what's going on on the Earth at present. Very much what you'd expect during a major catastrophe like a worldwide flood. Here's a picture of the Chenarib at the base of that uh, uh, Chinle formation. It's now been raised to formational uh, status. Uh, the, the constant change in uh, classification of these layers, it's, it's troublesome in a way. But uh, geologists like to name formations. Uh, you're famous if you name a formation. Uh, but th this is a Chenarib. used to be part of the Chinle. Now it's uh, for the Chenarib formation. Uh, notice how coarse the grains are and so on. Uh, larger grains there run about one to two centimeters. It's a coarse conglomerate spread over 100,000 square miles. Layers only about 100 feet thick, average 100 feet thick. How do you do that? Here's another picture to show you a little bit how widespread it is. Right at the green arrow, you see those whitish layers there. Uh, this is in Capitol Reef National Monument, uh, looking over the region. And you, you can see more of the whitish layer all over the place, but it's 100,000 square miles, that little thin layer there at the, at the, at the end of that uh, green arrow there, the little whitish layer there at the green, green arrow and so on. Totally. You don't see this going on. And it's a conglomerate. Think of the forces involved in this to have to spread that conglomerate over such, such tremendously widespread uh, areas. And uh, it's not just that. I mean, here's another one. Uh, th this is in the, the middle of Utah, San Rafael Swell area. Uh, reddish layer down there at the bottom is the Entrada. The uh, bluish layer, greenish layer up there is the Morrison. We talked to you about that one that runs, you know, from Texas to Canada. But look up at the top. See some blocks up here. All, the, all these, all these uh, blocks here, they form a conglomerate. And uh, Stokes, a uh, geologist, talks about this conglomerate. And he associates that conglomerate with another similar conglomerate found further north in Wyoming, over most of the state of Wyoming. It's the uh, basal conglomerate of the Cloverleaf Formation. So we've got this conglomerate here. We've got it in, in, over most of Wyoming. 
How do you explain this? Well, uh, the Shinarab, most geologists explain, it's a river deposit, you know. Well, you know, a, a river spreading stuff over 100,000 square miles, no topography. We don't have such on the Earth at present. Uh, this one here, again, the, the same problem. Stokes says, well, maybe these are pediments. What are pediments? Pediments are deposits at the foot of cliffs. For instance, when uh, material falls down here from, from up here and so on, it tends to form a pediment down here uh, where the cliff isn't is as stiff. How do you get a pediment over 100,000 square miles? Those deposits, they just sit there at the bottom of the cliff. So it doesn't fit a river, doesn't fit a pediment, but it's what you'd expect during the Genesis flood. Well, uh, it's hard to imagine the, the conditions that would spread these unique rather unique deposits over such widespread areas. To move the sediment over such immense areas would require unusual catastrophic levels of energy. Uh, some propose transport at the rate of uh, hundreds of miles per hour. Uh, you do have to recognize that the Grand Banks earthquake spread that uh, turbidite, the Grand Banks turbidite, uh, in 13 hours. Uh, and it was just traveling at 60 miles per hour. There are a lot of complex uh, things happen, whether the sediments are entrained, whether they drag along the bottom, whether they uh, float across and so on. There's turbulent flow, there's laminar flow and so on. It, it's a very complex science and the question of, of transport, but we do know that it can occur like it did for the Grand Banks earthquake, where you spread 40,000 square miles of deposit there in 13 hours. Well, uh, what do geologists do about this? Uh, it's uh, interesting. They have had a model for it. The model has not survived, but uh, it is still used. Thornbury, for instance, states Little of the Earth's topography is older than tertiary and most of all older than Pleistocene. What is he saying here? Mo he's saying most of the layers below are flat. That's just what you expect during the flood. Our present topography seems to be very recent. What do we mean by tertiary and Eocene? Here, here's the geologic column here. Here's your tertiary. So most of the topography is this or up here, Pleistocene. Down here, you don't find the topography there. Sounds like maybe it's laid down during the flood, doesn't it? Now, uh, question. Where are the ancient Mount Everest and the ancient Grand Canyons expected over the assumed hundreds of millions of years of Paleozoic and Mesozoic times? You don't find those fossil Grand Canyons, those fossil Everest and so on. Uh, and it's openly admitted, you know, hey, most of our topography is tertiary and most of it Pliocene, uh, Pleistocene. Uh, so, you know, it, it's another thing that's very strange as you go out there and look at those things is that the present topography, quite irregular, you know, you got these mountain chains all over the place. Uh, you've got some older mounds like the Urals or, or the Appalachians. Uh, that don't uh, challenge uh, our topography of the Andes and uh, the Rocky Mountains and so on, or the Alps and so on that are twice as high. Uh, so there is a, some, some older topography there, but most of it seems to be very recent and the rest of it seems to be very, very quite flat. But you, and you could have uplift, uh, you would have had to, in view of the data we look at, during the flood, and so on, so you don't need to limit it. But it's strange that uh, most of our topography seems to be limited uh, to the 
Paleozo, I mean to, to the tertiary, especially the last part of it. Well, uh, so what is, what is the evolutionary, might say, long ages uh, model for explaining these flat layers you have out there? Well, they say, hey, they eroded flat. And uh, the term used for a flat plane is called planet plane, which uh, is uh, uh, the explanation, has been the standard explanation for these very flat regions that you find. You, you start with a flat plane and you go through a cycle. You uplift it, then you have erosion, step two, then three, you have it erode down to flat. So you get, you get another flat plane. Uh, this diagram will help you understand here. Uh, you gotta get push the right button here. Cycle of erosion. This is the pentaplane model. Youth, take, take a region that is flat, you uplift it, youth. Um, it starts to be eroded. Step two. Highly irregular. Let that continue and keep on continuing. And uh, some geologists agree, hey, it would take too long. Even our geologic time won't permit this. But uh, it's the model. Uh, let it continue till you have everything flat. You know, uh, gravity pulls down and uh, erosion tends to be vertical because of that, but you can get side stuff there if you wait long enough. The idea is, hey, you can get an old age in a plane. Now, what you need to keep in mind here, uh, to get a peneplain, you're going to have to have all your rivers at the same level, or it's not going to be flat. And so, the probably the, the best model for the, getting rivers at the same level is where the rivers enter the ocean. So you have them all at the same level entering the ocean. Hence, uh, you allow enough time, more than usual geologic time, you might get to, to step three. Then you start over again with your cycle. What have you done when you go through a second cycle here? You have destroyed your old peneplain. So, on the basis of that model, you should never find one of these on top of the other. Yet, you know, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, as when I discussed with you the, the paraconformities and so on, you remember, they're all over the place. Uh, here, here's uh, a comment uh, from Bloom. This is at the time uh, IDs were changing uh, during those 50 50s and 60s when major geological changes took place. Uh, plate tectonics came in at the time and so on. <coughs> he, he makes this statement in his book, The Surface of the Earth. Says, the geological record of sedimentary rocks is full of unconformities. Those are gaps where you have layers missing. That represent long periods of emergence and erosion of continent-sized regions. He says these uncommon are commonly nearly planar. Now, the problem is you can't find a good example of a peneplain anywhere on the surface of the Earth right now. There are uh, some very minor ones suggested in England, I think, and so on, but uh, nothing of the size that we usually find here where they have this flat uh, erosion. And he admits it here. He says, it would be appropriate to describe a modern planet plane, you know, somewhere on the surface of the Earth, since you got this sedimentary record full of these things. It would be appropriate to describe a modern planet plane as a conclusion of this section. Unfortunately, none are known. See, the past was different. I'm telling you very clearly here. You don't have any of these things. It's a model. Uh, it's a little more here. Uh, listen to it. this is They're trying to get rid of the model here. 
uh, Professor Carl's geomorphology textbook. Known as the cycle of erosion, it was forced upon a landscape evolution in humid lands of special adaptation for deserts, glaciers, highlands, and coasts. Decades of semantic bickering followed during which true age was confused with geometry and historical evolution replaced by a priori mechanistic sequences. Of course, these folks all believe in long ages, you understand. None of the underlying theoretical points was tested empirically. In the end, an observational science was reduced to a parlor game of inductive reasoning that could be mastered by a freshman student. ID, yeah, well, it, it's there. The last paragraph there is extremely important. It says, division geomorphology, as it was called, that's that cycle of erosion I was telling you, died a death of sterility several decades ago despite the lingering stage and cycle approach of most textbooks. They still talk about this. It's the only thing they have to go on. But they don't have a single example of a modern peneplain. On the other hand, the flood model explains this very nicely, you know. The reason these things are so flat, there, there wasn't time for all this erosion. Layers were laid in flat one on top of the other. Different sources produced layers, uh, different parts of the geologic column, and so on. Well, uh, just to, this is the 211 modern, very popular book on geomorphology. Um, historical geometry has developed since Davis's time. That cycle was uh, Davis's pentaplane model and so on. And geomorphologists no longer squeeze the interpretations of long-term changes in landscape into the straight jacket of the geographical cycle. They go into other discussions, but do not explain the flatness of those pentaplanes. Uh, you can't find a modern example. Well. Uh, some details of sedimentary deposit here. Uh, we have here a layer, you see it right up there. At the end of that arrow, this is in near Price, Utah. That layer starts at Castlegate, Utah. It's called Castlegate Sandstone. Runs clear into Colorado, 100 miles. You follow that flat, little thin flat layer there all across. 100 miles uh, in the Grand Canyon. Various units are, are subdivided. Uh, uh, for instance, right here, you have uh, this region right here, the reddish region, mo most of it, uh, not the top slope there, but from, from here on down to there. Used to be called Supai Formation. It's now divided into four different formations. Uh, found all over the Grand Canyon. We're talking about 100 miles here where these units maintain their identity over that. I mean, this is incredibly flat deposition, folks. Incredibly flat. And then the red wall in the same, same situation. Uh, McKee and Guchek, who wrote the classic paper on the red wall, that's this layer right here. It is divided into four subunits. And they claim those four subunits are consistent throughout the whole Grand Canyon. How could you have, you know, you're, you're talking about just uh, less than 100 feet of topography over, uh, well, Grand Canyon would be about 15,000 square miles. Uh, this layer goes, covers most of northern Arizona. We're talking several hundred thousand square miles for the red wall. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a different story out there. Uh, Moab limestone, uh, that, that, let me just back up here. You want to see the Moab line? It's this layer right below the red wall. This layer right here, uh, down to this region. Uh, that Moab limestone shows layers that are tremendously fine and spread over tremendously widespread areas. Uh, for instance, uh, McKean Resser, still the classic reference to this. 
he talks about a layer here. We just go down to the bottom of the. Uh, he says the conglomerate layers are only a few inches thick, but form a zone of several feet. The Mexican lateral extent of the zone is 55 miles. I mean, this is tremendously widespread, consistent deposition. Uh, look at this, this again, same paper. Uh, he talks about another layer here. He says, there's a fine, even grained reddish gray sandstone, only a few feet thick, which extends from Grand Wash Cliffs eastward at least 35 miles to the vicinity of Granite Park. 35 miles. Uh, again, they go on here. Talk about 17 widespread key marker layers move out, spend, spreading from 30 to 95 miles within that layer. Uh, and it, it's this layer right here. Uh, from here down to there in the Grand Canyon, you see it all over the place. Uh, in that region here it is over here, and so on. So it's all over the Grand Canyon. Then we have coal, tremendously flat layers of coal. Here's a, uh, and you, you notice uh, that lower layer, there's a layer of rocks and that's parting. These are called partings. Uh, here's another example. That, that last uh, picture was in Utah. This is in New Zealand. Notice that layer conglomerate right in the middle of it, of the coal layer. Looks like a lot, a lot of transport. Uh, and here we're back in Utah. Uh, at the end of that red arrow, see that little thin layer parting? just a few centimeters thick. Uh, Steve Austin describes half a dozen of these layers, 1,500 kilometers square in Kentucky, and then the coal, coal deposits there. So, uh, then uh, lastly, just mentioned the consistent Grand Canyon. Uh, you have strata of each and every age were remarkably uniform. This is the classic on the Grand Canyon. Davis, uh, sorry, Dutton, tertiary, 1882, monograph number two. It says the strata of each and every age were remarkably uniform over very large areas and were deposited near, very nearly horizontally. Nowhere have we found thus far what may be called local deposition or such as a restricted narrow belt uh, contracted area. Now, some de local deposition has been found uh, since then, but it tells you, you look at that kind of, it looks, you know, remarkably uniform over wide areas. Uh, and just a few pictures here. Here are your formations. You go through them here and you see all these different formations. Uh, some of them are, you know, like the supai is divided into four parts, the red wall is divided into four parts. Here I I got to fly over the Grand Canyon in a helicopter the other day. And uh, the uh, first time, I mean, I've been through the Grand Canyon in a, in a river raft, but uh, ne never got to uh, fly over it this close. Same layers exactly through there. Uh, you go to another place uh, further west. L same layers again, you notice the reddish layers dominate in the middle. Uh, Kaibab on top, Torwe, Coconino, some other right there, if you know those. Same layers all the way through. Uh, again, same thing on your left here that represent the same layers on the right of this picture. And uh, you get clear to the western Grand Canyon and you've got almost the same layer. There are some differences there. In the uh, Supai, uh, the Pakun and Calville limestone tends to dominate there. Uh, there's a Grand Wash Dolomite you can see halfway down there. That's part of the Muab. Uh, but you only find that Grand Wash Dome about half through half of the Grand Canyon. So there are some differences, but uh, the lateral continuity is, is totally unexpected. Uh, this is just more of the Western Grand Canyon showing you the tapetes down at the bottom that we had in the first uh, picture we showed you and so on. So, uh, conclusions. The incredibly widespread sedimentary deposits we find on Earth are much more like what we'd expect from the catastrophic Genesis flood, then from slow local deposition over hundreds of millions of years. Far-reaching scientific data 
supports the biblical account of beginnings. And I mean that far-reaching both literally and figuratively, folks. These are, these uh, formations are extremely far-reaching. You do not have to give up scientific in order, in integrity in order to believe the Bible. There's a lot of data out there, and you go out there and look at it. Uh, hey, this is very different than what's going on at present. When you find day after day as you travel around, same layers. Uh, final conclusion, you can trust the Bible. Okay, questions? Um, one one point I'll make now: uh, conglomerate is the most coarse type of sedimentary rock. You go from shale, well, and maybe I, I limestone. Think, yeah, you have you have uh, some flexibility in conglomerate. You can have fine conglomerates, coarse conglomerates, and so on. But yeah, it tends to be uh, uh, the most. I mean, the, the dominant. Uh, and the Shinarab, you're talking about stones like that all through it. Some of the Shinarab is fine sandstone, coarse sandstone, and some of it's like that, yeah. Uh, and 100,000 square miles. Uh, how far down were the uh, fossils in these the sedimentary layers? You find fossils, good fossils, let's put it this way, uh, clear down to the bottom of the Cambrian, okay? You do find some fossils below but this is a, uh, uh, a lot of them are, are just, well, uh, you know, uh, ooh, his name skipped my mind right now, the leader of the uh, geological survey, uh, I hope he comes to mind. Uh, he went up there in Canada and he talked about stromatolites. He identified eight stromatolites, you know. Every one of those has been challenged by other geologists as not being valid species. So, it, you know, it's, uh, you do have some very good microscopic organisms. Uh, the Gunflint Church, for instance, in Canada, that are Precambrian. Uh, but uh, these things are transported easily. You go to you go to um, Savannah, Georgia region, you drill down, you find living organisms uh, 600 feet down and between. But some of those organisms are algae. Now, yeah, algae has to have light to grow. They didn't grow there. Obviously transported in there. Uh, you, you, for these microorganisms, you can have a lot of transport during the upset of the flood. No problem. I shouldn't say no problem, but it, uh, it's not uh, a serious problem. I was wondering if any of these had been laid down before creation, when the earth was covered with water. You mean before creation week? Yeah, well, a lot of uh, your Precambrian sediments, for instance, there in the Grand Canyon, we have a uh, a lot of Precambrian sediments there. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them up in Montana and so on. Uh, a lot of creationists think, and a lot of them don't, that the, those those were there before the flood, and probably before Creation Week, uh, as part of this earth that was dark and covered with water, as implied in Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2, and Psalms 24 2, and Psalms. 136, 6, and 2 Peter 3, verse 5. Uh, all those suggest, you know, hey, maybe there's an earth here before. And then I would say, you know, well, these, uh, these things, that these good cases they find were infiltrated during the flood. That's, yeah. I guess we, we should point out. Uh, it is 1130 now, so uh, those of you who need to leave. Uh, like to know that, I'm sure. Any other questions? It was half dome formed in Yosemite. What's that? It was half dome formed in Yosemite. That well, it's, it, it's a Mesozoic granite. Okay, it's not sediment. 
it's an igneous rock. It came from molten material. We would say this, some of the catastrophic, there was some uplift during the flood that produced these Mesozoic uh, layers like Half Dome in Yosemite. So the shear off and all that was formed during the flood then? Uh, possibly a little bit after. Uh, it's glaciated. Uh, the Yosemite Valley is glaciated. Probably occurred. Uh, one model is that during the flood there was sufficient occlusion of sunlight due to volcanic activity that uh, temperatures dropped enough so that you had uh, ice. You had ice forming, forming an ice age there. But the, the other thing is the fact that uh, that the uh, Missoula flood happened suggests that there was some glaciation after the flood as well. And uh, yeah, some of yeah, Yosemite may yeah, have formed after yeah, the flood. Yeah, uh, definitely it'd be post-flood. I was trying to remember the name of the, where they had the theory that doesn't exist anywhere on Earth, that it's, it's the erosion. Oh, the peneplain? Yeah, peneplain. Yeah. Um, it seems kind of ridiculous that they'd come up with these theories that if you followed it to the next level, it would disappear. <laughs> it, it seems kind of uh, stupid, actually. Yeah, well, that's, you know, there's, there's that problem. <laughs> you destroy, I mean, you should not, if you're going to have a baseline that's the ocean, uh, you should not have one pinnacle on top of the other. I mean, uh, this is... Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, it, lateral, you know, uh, gravity pulls down, it pulls water down, so on. erosion tends to be vertical. Uh, to get uh, water to produce a flat uh, topography is very difficult unless you have a major washout. Now, when I showed you the first picture I showed you was of the Grand Staircase. That uh, looks like it had to be a major washout. Those cliffs uh, eroded down slowly. You'd expect a lot of uh, talus uh, material there uh, at the base and so on. No, it's washed out quite clean. It looks like it's washed out by the receding waters of the flood. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not hard to find data that supports. Uh, the biblical account, if you, if you look, if you just go by scientific interpretations, of course, you've got a, you know, uh, you've got half a million scientists interpreting science without God, and only about a handful that put yeah. God and the Bible into the picture. Uh, you're going to be overwhelmed by that scientific literature, probably, but uh, if you go by the data, not the interpretations, you can go out there and look. Well, it's it's there. Mm. It's it's strange because <coughs> if you, it, it almost is so uh, so strange that it's it's unbelievable, and I think that's part of the problem. It it just doesn't seem like people could keep believing things that that the evidence does not mm. support. Well, uh, th th this is. Uh, the dominance of a paradigm, yeah. you know? People believed, you know, in witch hunting for a long time. Fortunately, they, they gave that one up. <laughs> uh, uh, people, you know, uh, flat earth, that's not a good example at all. Uh, never was it accepted view. Uh, but uh, <coughs> these ideas come and go. And, uh, you know, and. Uh, during the Dark Ages, uh, scholasticism dominated. In the Greek period, uh, reason was a dominant thing, uh, Plato and so on. And uh, now, it's materialistic science, materialistic science that excludes God from its interpretation. And so this is the best they can come up with. It's interesting, just like the Ten Commandments, the, the evidence here is literally written in stone. I mean, it's, it's everywhere you could Whenever you see these, you can't see, you don't realize that they cover such large distances, but just yeah. just the fact that they're consistent, consistently flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thinking of erosion. Yeah, so I was wondering about your 
thin turbidites. Mm -hmm. They go over such a large area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think in my mind, you know, with mm -hmm. the, the mechanics of a, a storm, a big storm like the flood. Mm -hmm. You've got mm -hmm. water uh, covering mm -hmm. the land. It's probably flowing off the land into the oceans all the time. Um, there's a lot of current happening mm -hmm. at that time. Um, to me, it seems like the water would be pretty cr um, Mix, mixed up, mixed up, um, mm -hmm. moving around mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. It seems like <clears throat> it seems like those thin turbidites need kind of mm -hmm. a stable water uh, placement that that doesn't move too much, so you can have this cloud go over and lay its um, material down on the ground, or on the mm -hmm. bottom of the ocean. How would you, and, and plus you've got all the other turbidites is, that have to form during that year and a half. So you're gonna get a lot of conflict between the two, you know, and all that's gotta happen mm -hmm. without mixing those layers up so you'd have these thin layers that, mm -hmm. that are differentiated. Um, yeah. How would you reconcile that? Is it just is okay. it just the size of the earth, the size of the the uh, water, or yeah. what? Uh, okay, you, you have to write. the layers are there. They're unique. They're they're widespread. I mean, this is undebatable. Uh, were the waters of the flood that mixed up? Uh, Forty days. Uh, and you can have several turbidites in the same place. Would they mix everything up? Uh, not necessarily. Maybe 150 days. We, we, you know, we, we interpret the flood account several ways. Maybe it took 150 days for the waters to, to rise. It, that, that's debatable. Uh, but uh, water doesn't mix up that easily. Uh, you know, the Amazon River carries fresh water out for, well, I don't know, 40, 50 miles into the ocean. It doesn't mix up. Uh, you're talking about a different scale here in terms of mixing things up, uh, that uh, everything wasn't all stirred up during that flood. There's no way. Uh, when we have major floods now, for instance, you know, you go to... Colorado, they had a overnight that they produced about what, uh, over a hundred layers, over a hundred lamina during one flood. This is a major catastrophe. Over a hundred lamina were laid down. Uh, these things tend to settle down uh, in a flat pattern. The, of course, the uh, Grand Banks earthquake did it all in 13 hours, but uh, it's not answering your question about turbulence of water. It is answering the fact that they can go quite fast. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as uh, necessarily everything is all stirred up all the time at all. I, I don't know how you'd get these layers out there if it was. Uh, but if it was water stirred, it's not going to, I mean, you can stir up all the water you want to. You've got a deposit of turbidite that's heavy. It's not going to mix that up. In, in the laboratory, we can, you know, I showed you that one tank of water and the turbidite coming down. And uh, uh, you, you can lay another one on top. It doesn't have to be hard at all. And you can lay these one on top of the other. The new turbidite does not disturb the old one. So it's, you know, it, it's plausible. <coughs> I'll just re respond to that. <clears throat> it is hard to understand how things happen during the flood. We've never experienced anything like that. Right. But on the other hand, when you, when you look at how different these ancient sediments are from what happens today, that's a far greater problem. Uh, it, it's just uh, incomprehensible why, how it could be so different than, than what we experience today. And sometimes, you know, we all wonder sometimes, hey, is this true. I start thinking about those layers out there. And I say, hey, uh, uh, 
how else do you explain those things out there? How else do you explain them? It looks like it fits the Bible very much. Right here. Oh, oh. I don't know who's first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, last week we were enthralled and our minds were stretched with Dr. John Bar Baumgartner's presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to integrate his model with yours now to uh, mm -hmm. see how we might put them all together. If, if I understood him right, uh, the continental drift and the split up of the continents didn't happen until after the Grand Canyon was formed. Is that kind of the no. impression you got? No, no, he, he, he stated specifically, I'm a post-flood Grand Canyon. He's with Steve Austin on that. He thinks maybe a century or two after the flood, there was ponded water to the east okay. of the Grand Canyon, and the, the ponded water cut well, through. The layers was, were laid down before. I was thinking the layers were laid down before the flood. That's what I'm getting at. Oh, okay. The yeah. original deposit and uh, laid, down, laid be down before, I mean, uh, early in the flood, before continental drift. Yeah, yeah he, he starts his flood at the Cambrian. Right. But he doesn't start the breakup of the continents until... Some, somewhere in the Mesozoic, I think he said mm -hmm. Jurassic. Well, I'm not sure. Because that. the oceans, mm -hmm. they're not that old. The, you know, the splitting yeah. up of South America from uh, yeah, you, Africa. You don't find old the, fossils Yeah, there. the Atlantic Ocean, if you trace it all out, mm -hmm. it, you don't have old fossils. And yes. Uh, I guess my question would be, to ask you to come in on what we heard last week. Uh, and that is, mm -hmm. we're dealing with sediments on top of the lighter granitic crust. And so mm -hmm. Grand Canyon is kind of up high. Mm -hmm. And where were the antediluvian oceans that were tend to fill with flood sediments? You know, that's where uh, it seems like the no. where we have mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of the sediments mm -hmm. should be antediluvian oceans, but mm -hmm. according to Baumgartner, this is on granitic crust that is higher than oceans. <laughs> so I, I know um, you don't have to solve his problem. I think he <laughs> created the problem, but I'm uh, interesting if interested if you have a comment on it. Well, I, I would uh, say uh, for one. Uh, the, the dome of the Grand, the uplift of the Grand Canyon is a late event. During the flood, it was low, and sediments poured in there. So you would suggest that uh, this was a, an antediluvian low point that was filled up first with the Probably early part of the least, flood. At least during the flood, it was low. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I would say. So that, that, that would, uh, then there was uplift and uh, but now that works nice with Grand Canyon because it is a dome and that's one of the theories how it was formed that the dome was split yeah that's one of the theories I there are three or four theories I mean, you, your Grand Canyon is a hundred your dome's a hundred miles now uh, and you lift it up we, uh, we 5,000 feet you not get much of a split we have a lot mm -hmm. of um, sediments, fossil-bearing sediments in eastern U.S. that are not on a dome, um, would a lot of those also be low points before the flood? Sediments only go downhill. That's what I was Gravity thinking. Gravity is, is yeah. still operating. Yeah. So the, I think what Dr. <coughs> Brand was suggesting is uh, the world back then was so different that we have no way of comprehending perhaps it how to a, reconstruct it, was, it. It was not only different geologically, it was different biologically because you do have to accommodate all those Mesozoic reptiles, uh, flowering plants only higher up, uh, our coal deposits, calamities, the equicetum, and so you know all those things. Uh, ha had to uh, have a place to exist. And so uh, uh, 
there was a different ecology then. Different ecology then. Yeah. We do have one interesting modern example, and that is uh, the uh, flood that occurred when uh, the uh, volcano up there in Washington uh, blew up, and it uh, formed that uh, dam of uh, mm -hmm. sediments. And then when the water mm -hmm. finally broke through it, in mm -hmm. uh, literally 36 hours' time, it carved a miniature Grand Canyon that was something like 30 feet deep. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it showed multiple mm -hmm. layers, very similar to mm -hmm. Grand Canyon layers, just mm -hmm. one layer after another from the flood uh, waters that had come over it before. Mm -hmm. So that we do have a, set of a modern example of sediment uh, sure. layering uh, right up in that uh, area. T Teton Dam was what, 300 feet high, cut down in less than an hour. Uh, cavitation, you'll be hearing about that next week, uh, can erode quite rapidly, even very hard rock. So it's, uh, uh, we're not short of some examples. Uh, they just don't occur very often right now because we're in a relatively calm period. So it's not involved in our thinking. Uh, uh, and so uh, people tend to think you know more in terms of uniformitarianism. But you go out there and look at those layers, I have no other explanation. I mean, this is so anomalous. No explanation but the biblical model. <coughs> in regard to um, where the continents were before, there's at least one type of evidence that should be uh, taken into consideration. <coughs> As was said here, that you'd, you'd expect in a big flood the fossils to go into the ocean. Well, worldwide, the fossils, including the bulk of the marine fossils, are not in the oceans. Right. They're on the continents. Okay, so we have to <coughs> put that into the picture, and that can <coughs> maybe give some suggestions where the continents were before. The, this is, you know, we have more marine sediments on the continents than we have land sediments on the continents. Something very different happened. Yeah. Okay. You folks have a good Sabbath. <laughs>